Start recording. All right. Now I'm going to pull open your download, and then we will pull up. Huh? Yes, yes. One moment. I'm going to find it. Mm, that's the wrong one. Oh, I've got to extract it. Uh, which you're doing dice? Yeah. Dice. Let's see which one that is. Put it. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, you didn't. I thought you already volunteered. No? No. Okay. Pretty sure this is a different job. I'm never presenting. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll let you speak. Basically, my goal is to like have you walk through the logic of what you did. Okay. Cool. Okay. So I took probably a different approach uh, than the rest of you, but I found this was like kind of what naturally came to me immediately. Did, is this with the RAND file or is this the? Yeah, it's the RAND file. Okay. Um, so basically, I wrote two methods that constructed uh, large uh, arrays that could handle basically like percent decimals. So basically, it's just a for loop that iterated a thousand times, and based on the percentage uh, allocated to each side, I created that number within the like. Distribution at a thousand. So if there was a hundred, it was a fifteen percent. There's a hundred fifty ones, a hundred twos, hundred fifty threes, uh, two hundred fifty sixes. You know, um, I decided that the six die would be the biased die in this outcome. Um, so there's the fairly distributed and the biased distributed. So basically, that just outputs two different, uh, essentially like quote weighted arrays. Um, and then this uh, runs through the number, receives the number of simulations, and basically uh, decides a random int within the. I just take the random int, and then I take a random um, index of the array, and then that creates another array, and then I like basically plot the sides. I don't know why they plotted them these next to each other, but they are different. So. That's how I did it. Question. I'll, I'll ask for questions first, then I'll give my physics interpretation of what's going on. So, uh, I guess tell us already about where you're entering the amount of time you're um, running the loop for. Yes. And so that's like kind of a, a different process than creating the die. That's just basically saying how many times it wants to choose from the given, the two given arrays. And then plot that those results. So if you scroll back up to the top, mm -hmm. the way that I would, I kind of think of this is that you have like a, a thousand-sided die, like like your list is all the it's a list of all the sides of the die sort of, and like the bias is like how many times those thousand sides are one, how many thousand yes those are two yes, and and so it's. The simulation is slightly different than an actual sort of like six-sided die, and that is a thousand sides, and some portion of those sides are one, and some thousand, some of the thousands are two. It's a slightly different physical simulation, but interestingly, that very distinct physical approach gets the same sort of measurement result. So, <laughs> congratulations on the novelty. What works works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Alex, you're going to volunteer to be. All right. Let me get rid of these here. And what's your. Which. What's your uh, yeah. Or RP, if that's my yeah. Okay. Come on down. Yeah. 
Hey guys. Um, so I thought the the example that Ben had in class was already a good start. So I use that as my oh shit. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I shocked myself. Uh, so I use that as a good base, and I uh, cited that at the top. Um, but essentially, what I did and how it was a little different uh, was um, actually the top half just importing. I thought it was good. And, uh, this is a good start already, so I just left it alone. I did a picture of my head just to see how the data was coming in, and from the first view of it, it looked like it was coming in as a long uh, as an integer. So the first thing was to tan, turn everything into a string. Um, so this is the first change that I did, and then um, I remembered that it's um, uh, what is it slices when we were looking at lists uh, during the first couple of classes. So I thought, why not? I could probably do a slice as well. Now uh, the first data frame that um, I created was data frame two, which is essentially my main that has it, everything on there. And then I created a new column inside my data frame that's called time um, time of measurement hour, which is essentially um, just the hour um, that the event occurred. Excuse me, sorry, the date hour that the um, data that the event occurred, and then an hour column which just gives me the um, uh, what we call it, the hour in which the uh, you know uh, the energy was consumed. So from there, um, you know, I just made the uh, adjustment to make sure that is a date time data format. Excuse me, data type. And then after that, I just created two extra data frames: one that aggregated everything by the hour, and one that aggregated everything by the um, date hour. So the first one, uh, by the instructions, I just create an hourly graph. Um, and for this, I just use the, um, uh, what did I use? Um, oh, sorry, what was my, um, uh, matplot, matplotlib, that's what I used uh, just to create the first, um, uh, first graph. And like I said, all I did was I took the column, I used that as my group value, and then just aggregated every value behind it. And I think it gave me a good amount of, uh, you know, a pretty neat uh, for the, uh, what is it, for my analysis, I thought that everything was up to par. Everyone was sleeping between 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., and then after that, people start waking up, and around 6, you notice that there's an, um, you know, ongoing trend up until you get to the 18th hour, which is around 6 o'clock, and I'm guessing people are getting home and cooking dinner, so I'm guessing you're using the most energy then. And then um, for the following, uh, since I already had a data frame that had everything by date time, I just once again used the same solution, just changed the, uh, uh, what is it? I just changed the data frame and I just the column that I was using, aggregated the data. And if I double click on this, I can actually get a really neat version of the uh, graph and I can see the date time broken out for the instructions. Um, and once again, I think everything as usual, most people are, if we're looking at this in a seven day calendar, most people are using this um, pretty heavily during the weekday and then less on the weekend. Um, and from an hourly standpoint, it's still the same one. Um, and the, the last thing was that the first of the month seems to have a lot of activity, so I started thinking of why that could be. Um, and I guess it's getting late to close out the month if you work in a financial institution, but that's about it. Any questions, guys? Ben, any questions? That's good. Thanks a lot. So I, I like your. I can leave it open for a second. Yeah. The, the takeaway here that I was sort of listening for is that it's not just like this is a bunch of pretty colors on a slide, right? There's some story that you can sort of map into that picture to see if it makes sense. And that's like the, the what I would refer to as a sanity check. Picture, like, does it like if you see some spike right at like 3 a.m. Like either there's a story to chase down there, or I did some analysis wrong, right? And so, which one of those is like the right path? I don't have an answer for that, but it, you should definitely be thinking in terms like of a story. I think we can yeah, zoom back out on this. So like again, this pretty much makes sense from a storytelling perspective, and again, that's for you as a human data scientist get to apply your humanness to tell the story, right? Like. The computer can make the pretty picture, but you need to stand back and say, does this make sense, right? Like, what's the story? Is the story consistent? That's like a good way of figuring out whether it's outliers or whether you did your analysis incorrectly or incompletely. So, thank you. Any other more general questions on the homework assignment? I mean, the, 
I have a question on yeah. yeah. demonstrating the toggle flip to expand it. Yes. Is that a standard trigger thing? So it's not working in Git. So not working in uh, Windows or yeah, on Windows. Yeah. So I would suggest maybe so which browser you uh, okay. So I don't have a quick answer for that, but if you remind me after class, we can look it up. Uh, yeah, so I'm using Chrome, so I don't. <laughs> not <laughs> so the fun part of like this class is like everyone's using Windows, Mac, Linux, and like all the four different browsers, right? And like or whatever. Yeah, so. No. So. All right. We'll get back to the lecture. Right, yeah, so we'll be talking about time series. So you've already done some work in time series. So that's just like a very uh, initial foray into it. So we've done two randomly selected students. So thank you both for volunteering on that. We're getting uh, past the halfway point in the semester. So woohoo! Right, congratulations, you made it. Um, we've got a, a few more uh, topics to cover. If you have requests, I take requests, right? So it's pretty flexible. <laughs> uh, let me know if you have input and suggestions. Yeah. Project two, I don't know if I have a slide for that. Yeah, so I think on project two, if you have questions, I've given feedback on the proposals that I've seen submitted. Hopefully you've got those. And then basically we'll do a lecture, and then the next week we'll be doing in class work to reproduce the work done for the proposals. So I'll give more details on that uh, next week when it becomes more relevant. But that's what we're going to do. And then also, at the end of the note with project two is that the notebooks you submit, I'm planning on posting those by default to uh, an online resource that we can all see the results. So this is m me creating you some accountability, right? Like it's going to be graded, but it'll also be made visible to everyone. So if you have concerns on that and you don't want to have that, I totally understand and I appreciate your perspective, but please tell me, because by default, I'll be posting your content on the internet. It doesn't have to be associated with your name, so no one actually knows that it's your work, but if you want to have it associated with your name, that's cool. Right? So again, that's a conversation that we can have. Yes? Are there previous semesters uh, projects out there? No. <laughs> So <laughs> every semester is new. <laughs> I was just having a conversation before this class with some people about how to make next semester even more challenging. So <laughs> if you want to repeat next semester, it'll be different. <laughs> All right. So we're going to cover both time series and talk about linear regression. So some of you have already seen linear regression in 602. So we'll speed through that a little bit. Um, if you haven't seen linear regression before, just going to give you enough feel for it to understand why it's relevant in this domain. There's other places where it's relevant. Fourier transforms, it's pretty mathematical, so we're just going to talk about where to use it and why it's relevant for time series. But both of these are present in other domains. And then this whole class, it's sort of underwhelming in the sense of it's two and a half hours about a topic for which there are three other courses at UMBC, right at the graduate level. So. So this is just to give you, like, there's a huge depth here. We're only going to skim through the surface. Um, I was talking with some other data scientists where, where I work, and they're like, you know, we never got an education time series because either we're not you know, economists or we're not statisticians, and so we're coming into the data science field without any overview of, of time series analysis. So I'm trying to remedy that situation in this class with you. So <laughs> we're not going to cover everything there's to cover, but hopefully this is to get your eyes open to what the, the issues are in the domain. So yeah, that's statistics and uh, econ uh, was it? economists would go through those courses. But I don't know that anyone else has opted for those courses yet here. One thing I did find out about this specific system, this goes for like other classes too. Sometimes the senior level classes are basically the same class as the graduate level class. They're mm -hmm. just like mirrors of each other, even with a lot of like five years. Just for your mm -hmm. Yeah, so taking graduate level classes as an undergraduate is always <laughs> exciting. All right, so we're going to start with uh, the very basics of like what is a timestamp and why are we doing that? So, first off, we'll 
give a little bit of sort of like what is a time series, right? It's basically you can think of it very easily as anything where there's a timestamp and some measurement. And that's all it is, right? Like it's very easy in that sense, right? Like how hard could this be, right? Why would there be multiple semester long courses dedicated to that, right? <laughs> all right. And then so the word series, like that's the same thing in pandas, like just draw that mental connection of like that's a row or sorry, that's a column in pandas, right? That's sort of what we'll be working with for time series. Same thing. And then if you went crazy, right, you could have multiple sensors measuring different things at the same time. And then you could put all these columns together, to make it into a table. And we could even call it a data frame, right? Like, so you have this power already that you didn't even know, right? Like your data frame, right? Someone gives you a table, you're just like, I got those skills. Right? And so, so time series are right along the, th the, the skills we've already been building in this class, right? So that's good news. <laughs> right. So question for you, this is where you whip out your paper and pencil, and I'm not going to collect these pieces of paper, but this is for you to generate ideas of where would you observe, as a data scientist, time series data. So many, uh, not on the, yeah. So these other pieces of paper I gave you just for full scope disclaimer. So the anonymous comment, that's for you to reflect during this class on what are your sort of things you want to learn in Python. So I've had lots of feedback. Um, that's the paper for anonymous comments. Don't write your name in that. And then the other one, at the end of this class, I'll give you some time to write down what was not clear about this class and what you learned in this class. So those are the other two pieces of paper. But you should have a blank paper that is not sort of labeled. So if you need that, come around and give it to you. Anybody need a copy? Okay. Yes, that one, and then this. Yeah. All right, so write down some time series examples, and then after I've given you like a minute or so, we'll come back and we'll brainstorm together as a group. What did you write down? Trying to get something? Uh, yeah, financial market data. Comes in by phone. Okay. Well, Travis? Uh, weather data, like precipitation. And simulation sensor data, we collected it from the Data. What would be an example specifically within healthcare data? Uh, sensors.
network, okay? Yeah, computers. Network. Okay, one more. Yeah. And I stole my idea. <laughs> Birth certificates. Birth certificates, all right. People. All right. So these are like literally like every single domain, right? Like we've hit a bunch of them, right? Look at the diversity. So here's like this is the big exciting part of tonight's lecture, right? There are some skills that you're gonna learn with time series analysis. They're generic, right? They apply to any of these domains. So the power is you, armed as a data, skilled data scientist, will wander into some domain, any of these, right? And say, I can help you solve your problem. I know nothing about the domain itself, but I know about time series analysis. That's why this is a really useful skill. Because it's so generic, right? That's awesome. And so there's some really exciting things, right? You could make a bunch of money. You could like make huge healthcare improvements, right? Like you can make self-driving cars. All these things are like timestamp data. And like that's a really valuable and generic skill. So yeah, Internet of Things, right? Like I was hoping someone would like drop that, but it's just a generic term, right? <laughs> so basically the, the message is it is now very cheap to deploy sensors that report back to the mothership, right? Like here's a sensor value at this time from this device, right? And there's billions of those, and so there's gonna be lots of work to be done with all that data. And so <laughs> there's there's a lot of complexity, like what kind of analysis can we do that like is helpful? Because there's a lot of analysis that you can do. It's just like, oh, that's a cool picture, right? But then like you have to actually make something useful from the analysis. So, all right. So <laughs> the trick is that not all data is time series, right? And so it's useful to have some tool to measure of like, is this a time series data set or not? Because not everything is just going to magically show up with timestamps in it. Timestamps are usually that give away the timestamp data. That's not the only indicator, right? So, and the problem is like if someone like reorders your data for you for whatever reason, like make it you know more anonymized or something, they lose the fact that it was ordered. So the fact that things order matters. That's really the key indicator that the there's a timestamp dependence. Causality is what you're really sort of having a memory for. So if things happen before, it affects the current state, and that's going to affect the future state. That's really what timestamp data is about. Yes. Does anonymizing are they just reordering it, or will it actually take what portion of the data out? Right. So th there's a whole bunch of different things people do. So like, um, like removing whole columns, right, or like removing certain rows or certain fields. Like, it depends on specifically on what the data. But how you anonymize and remove sort of the information that makes it uh, a privacy issue, but still retain the patterns that are in there. So pe people, imp so there's always an intention to do the right thing, but the way in which people anonymize data might not have the consequence they're looking for. So like if you took timestamp data and then like shuffled it, you actually just lost all the information and didn't change any of the privacy. So you have to sort of understand why it's that you're doing it to, to, to make it more private. All right, so we're gonna do a little quick demo about uh, the fact that we can actually, there's a metric, right, that tells you whether something, uh, the order matters in the data set, or whether it's just random. Let's see if we can get to that. Order name. All right. All right, so first off, we're just gonna start with a really simple thing here, right? This picture of data increasing linearly. Everybody should be familiar with that's the data set, right? So the, the way that we can sort of like differentiate, does the order matter to this, is to ask, um, what's the difference between these two? What's the difference between these two and these two and these two and these two? And if that um, difference is dependent on the order, right, then we'll sort of see this called a, what's called a lag, flat, lag clock. So it's really looking at the difference between every sequential set. Uh, every, every sequential pairs. Right? So this is like the first measurement versus the the one after it. The second measure di uh, difference with the third measurement. And so it's just looking at the difference between all adjacent pairs 
and then plotting that difference on a plot. So here, it's the same. It looks like the same line plot, but the information it's presenting is different. All right. So that's like the straightforward concept. And there's a flag underscore plot in pandas. So it's really easy to just throw that, in, throw your column of data. Right. It's just taking a column of the values and looking at the difference between all the entries in the column. That's all it's doing. So why would why would that reveal anything useful, right? So let's look at something that's slightly more complicated. So we have this sine wave, if you've heard of those before. They're basically things that go like squiggly lines. Here I've introduced a little bit of noise into mine. And so it's making all these things, right? And so it's, does the order of that data matter? And so what a lag plot does, is it looks at the difference between all the adjacent values and then plots those. And like, regardless of whether you find it like pretty, I, what it's really telling you is that there is a dependence. Because if there weren't, it would just be a giant blob, right? The, 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 the difference between any two pairs would be a random value. And so what you get is this giant blob. But this is clearly not a blob. There's something going on here. So to contrast that with something that order doesn't matter, don't get a third data sample. So here, this is a, a normal distribution, Gaussian distribution. These are just points where they are really random, right? Like you're just, every point that you pick is independent of every other point. So what does the lag plot look like for that? Oops, no. half of the histogram. So, so here, you get this giant blob of points. That's because the order doesn't matter, so the difference between any two adjacent points is just random. So if you're not familiar with the Gaussian distribution, it's a bell curve. That's what this is showing. Question that. So, so a lag plot is a really quick way of picking out whether the order of the series matters. So, and then if you really want to go crazy, like here's a whole bunch of points, right, and you can sort of visually pick out this is a really nice bell curve. When we plot the lag plot of that, it's this giant blob, right? So order clearly doesn't matter. There's not a linear sort of like relation between the adjacent points. All right, everybody's happy with that. Moving on. Yes. Uh, so I actually that's a good point. The there are so I'm gonna answer that in here. So there should be some linear relation like this. There'd be other patterns that show up in your data, but it's not based on the point is it's not some well distributed sort of blob of data. So here, here there's a pattern, there's clearly something going on, but so you can draw like arbitrarily complicated uh, lag plots based on the, the time series you give it, but they're all gonna have that general sort of pattern. Okay, good question. All right, so now that we have some idea what a timestamp data is and, and how we're gonna apply it, where, where does this sort of like make the money, right? Like why, why is there such emphasis on this uh, currently? It's because we have all these sensors deployed everywhere and we think we can do something with that data. And the thing that we think we can do, basically it's like anomaly detection and sort of like predicting the future. And so we sort of hit this with the weather forecasting, right? That's a really straightforward example of uh, taking the data that you've observed and trying to extrapolate out to what the future is going to be. And you, and fortunately, that was my second slide, so it would have been a nice lead in, right? So, what you did is sort of look for patterns in data with your analysis, and we'll be doing more of that today. The reason people typically care about that is because they write huge checks, right? Like all the power lines that you see lying around, those just didn't spring magically, right? Someone spent a lot of money to get those in place because they did some analysis to figure out that people would pay them money after they spent their money. So predicting the load and how much infrastructure you should invest, right? That's a, that's a non-trivial question. We want to use data to, to answer that question of investment. So these are like nation scale questions, which means there's a lot of money being thrown around. So people get paid a lot of money to do this. All right, so we just said on weather, right? This is pretty sure for the obvious benefit is that there is a bunch of people willing to watch TV 
and therefore advertisers will spend money right on the weather station I know predicting this isn't just like because there are people who like predicting weather other people who like paying for the predictions of weather <laughs> so and then the last one is sort of like I would say pretty recent development right so there's a lot of voice recognition and image recognition that's in video all of that is like a timestamp series right, where the order of your frames matter so this is something that we will not cover that much in this class but it's machine learning in timestamp data is another big problem right like challenge all right and as i mentioned the skills that you'd pick up in any time series analysis are very generic so this is when someone hands you the timestamp you don't even have to ask what question they're interested in because this is what they're interested in right what's the trend what's the average where is it going right what happened very very generic and then we'll be focusing primarily in this class uh, tonight on a single timestamp series, right? Just one column. That is enough to take up your two and a half hour lecture, right? <laughs> and still just skim the surface. Where the real, you know, magic happens is when you have multiple sensors measuring different things. You do a combination of those. That's where the complexity of the story increases, and the value of that story really comes from. And the danger that I typically run into when I'm telling people that you could do analysis of data is that they'll do an analysis of a single sensor and make a story based on it. And the story lacks the context of all the other measurements that you could combine into there, right? The, the danger is that it's really hard to add more sensors in. The story gets more complicated. But your story based on a single sensor is usually incomplete. So don't get caught up in the fact that you have a measurement Try to understand what the holistic story is. No. Anyone here? So, <laughs> quick disclaimer: Has anyone does time series analysis? Like, am I speaking to experts? A little bit. I mean, nothing crazy, but you can kind of like track over annually, like how much you spend on a single budget, so you can apply seasonality to do that. Yeah, I'll get to Alex, but like the, the major one right now, right, it's tax season. And so like anyone who's a business owner knows that people in tax season spend more money based on those refunds, right, for large purchases. So like if you're a furniture store, now is the hot time. Right, so that's a seasonality issue. Alex? Um, Right. Yeah. So predicting sort of where the surge is going to be in the buyers, right? So that you can staff for that and yeah, have product. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if you were flying blind and didn't do that, you might make poor decisions as a business owner. Right. <laughs> in that day, right? All right. So no big surprise, I mean, like, hopefully this pa class has painfully re-emphasized you over and over the fact that when you get data, you'll have to clean up data. And the special thing about time series is the way that you clean up data is more complicated. So you take all those skills that you've developed so far and then add in some new ones because time series are even more messy. So my happy is that's life. All right, so these are, like, <laughs> the obvious repetitive questions that happen Every single time someone shows up with a time series database, right? <laughs> so you almost always see something where it's like the date, like a year, 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 month, month, day, day, and like some hours, and they never label the time zone. Like it's like they never realize that there are other people on the planet Earth other than the people in their local time zone. It just drives me wild, right? Because I don't get that. And then <laughs> another like super common assumption: my clock is always correct, right? Have you ever seen? One of those like old clocks, right? The analog clocks where it has like the hand on it, right? And like there's a battery in that, right? The battery dries, right? And then like the clock gets slower and slower and slower, right? Wait, wait, clocks aren't always right? Oh boy, right? <laughs> so like these are sort of like fundamental assumptions of everyone is where I am, my clocks are never wrong, 
right? And then I'll bait, I build all of my data collection on those assumptions. Well, now you've just sort of introduced some real fundamental flaws into the way that you are going to do your data analysis. And then you, as a data scientist, will have to reverse engineer how to fix those problems because the collection folks weren't making the right assumptions. That's your job. And then, like, <laughs> I mean, this one, hopefully, everyone's aware of is like, year, year, month, month, day, 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 you're like, what does the order matter, right? We'll always know what it is, except for the person analyzing the data who's not there at that time. That's you, right? You won't know what those assumptions were with a date. Hector. <laughs> Throughout the US government, you have automated reporting as compared to, you know, like literally like that. You don't know whether what you're seeing is because of the incident or the data. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. Like, like what is it actually that we're timestamping? Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, sometimes you'll run into issues where, like, for whatever reason, someone was constrained in the amount of space that they had, and so they made some wise decisions on how to save space. I didn't really make the timestamp smaller. Right. When you're when you're doing large databases where the timestamp is going to show up in every single row, these are the sort of like design considerations you make because storage costs money and you don't want to spend a bunch of money on storage. We'll just reduce the amount of data in the timestamp field. How could that hurt us, right? <laughs> so these are all like fun things, right? And by the way, this is just for a single timestamp data source. Right? What happens if we go with more than one sensor? All right. There's even more struggle involved. So the reason I'm telling you all of this pain and suffering is not because I'm going to inflect that on you for homework. I'm, I'm going to do that tonight. But uh, <laughs> these are things to think about because you're going to talk to people about the design of their data structures. They won't know what all the problems are going to be you face as a person who's going to analyze that data. So if you're armed with these sort of like observations, my hope is that you'll walk away being able to have a more informed conversation when you go to analyze or design data sets. So I won't belabor these too much, but basically every time zone uh, for every sensor, you'd think it would be in the same time zone if we're all in the same time. Right? But like, <laughs> that's a choice. Um, and then different data software produces different defaults. So it's just all over the place. <laughs> Is anyone scared yet? You should raise your hand. <laughs> you should be. All right. And then back to the, the point about designing data sets. So this is a problem that I was inflicted with recently, like uh, last week, to um, have a discussion about is the measurement uh, of the, of, let's say, a row in a data frame, is that a single timestamp sort of instant? Or is it a range of values, like a window, right? Is between 9 a.m. and 5 a.m., that whole thing is like a, a time slice, right, versus an instantaneous measurement? So that's like a design question. And then <laughs> in either case, right, like let's say I go down the instantaneous row, what happens if my instantaneous measurements aren't exactly at the same time? Do they still get to be in the same row or is that a whole different series, right? It gets kind of messy. Or if you go down the idea that a single row is a slice of time for an instant, then you can ask, like, am I labeling that at the start, in the middle, at the end? Where is my labeling for that row? All right, so I'll go over the specific data set that I was given and the problems that I faced with that, just to illustrate that first point a little bit more. What are called? Temporal analytics. <laughs> so, so this is, I don't know, good news, bad news. So the, the good news is, the Problems are the same thing, not the same thing, but the, the same sort of class of problems of data cleanup and resolving these issues. They're not glamorous, right? No one promotes you based on the fact that you cleaned up timestamp data. But that will be where a lot of your time is spent, like cleaning up data, cleaning data, right? Again, no one promotes you based on the fact that you cleaned up this horrendous data set. So there's a disparity between where you spend your time and where the sort of like creative effort is spent. Right? Then you go off and you apply your machine learning model for like a day or two, and then you present some results. You get the recognition for the good machine learning, not you know the month of data cleanup. So, sorry. <laughs> All right. So in this specific case, I was given uh, 6,000 CSVs. I'm not going to hit you with those tonight. I'm going to show you three of them. All right. And so in this data set, 
basically I had I had 150 pounds, but I put those off down to five for your case here. 93 rows, right? And then basically the part that I care about is the fact that I have a specific case and then time begin and time end in seconds, and then we'll ignore the other. So this time begin and time end, that row is a time slice, right? So basically every row is a five minute slice of time during which things are recorded. So the trick here is that the begin and end uh, is roughly, or should be, 300 seconds difference, which is five minutes. And so that's, that's Brittany. We have two columns dedicated to time that we care about. So one is the start and end, and then the difference between those two should be five minutes. Yes, just to confuse things. But for our purposes, you can ignore those two columns. Basically, that was 10 p.m., 10 or 6 p.m., right? Okay, so the question that I was asked is, for these two columns, are there any problems? That's literally the question I was given. And so, you know, basically it just, the first thing I did was I looked at the top of the uh, data frame and the bottom of the data frame. The range is sort of like reasonable given the problem. And so then uh, I looked for, are the entries in the columns unique? That was the first question I had, because it should be, right? Every start bin and every end bin should have a unique value in that column. So there's 93 rows and there's 93 unique entries to begin and 93 entries for the end. All right, so that was important. Can I ask, are these sequential? Do they increase, right, over time? And the answer was yes, they do, that's good. So I was happy, right, like no problems so far, everything is kosher. All right, now we ask the question of, is the difference between these two bins actually five minutes, right? It's always important to figure out what are the assumptions, and then can we test the assumptions? And so I created a new column called difference in seconds, and then I just took the difference between the end and the beginning, right? And you should expect that those would be 300 seconds. And so I found they're not. Right? They're not for one, three, which is at like 4.7 minutes rather than five minutes. Why that is, I have no idea. This was an automated data set recording for five minutes, or every, every five minutes for like, I don't know, 93 times five minutes, whatever that is, like a couple hours, right? So like, why this occurred, I have no idea. But the problem, the, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is figure out where your assumptions are, associate with the time series, and then validate those assumptions before doing the rest of the analysis. Right? So <laughs> this was a pretty easy sort of detection of an outlier given that data set. All right, and then I went through and I figured out where that is, and I had to figure out, like, are the adjacent bins any issue? And the answer was no. There, and then the last thing, this was kind of tricky, but I had to figure out, um, now that we know that there's a problem, and if you look at this one, the, the, so this bin, or sorry, this row, and it started and ended, and then this following row, started at the same time that this one ended. That means there was no gap between the time slices, even though one slice was slightly shorter than the other ones. So that's like totally wacky, right? Like you expect if one time slice was shorter by, what is it, by, so this one is 20 seconds short, yet the other ones are still close to it. Why that is, again, I have no idea. I'll defer back to the people who took the measurements, but there was um, continuity, gap, there was no gap. And so I needed to figure out, are there any other gaps between any of the other bins, right? Because all we've measured so far is that all the bins are five minutes. So we also needed to figure out, are there any gaps between the adjacent bins? So that was a sort of a, a set union issue. I won't try to explain this, but it's a little bit tricky, but basically you can set everything and then like see if there's any intersections. And so basically you can find gaps. It's a little, it's not conclusive, but it was sufficient, so. And then basically I went off and I did this for a few other data sets, and they also had problems. And this one was sort of similar, exact same value. I looked at my third CSV and it was high at 20 seconds. So there's a consistency now. We've looked in three of 6,000 CSVs. We've found three discrepancies, all of the same sort of pattern of being off by 20 seconds, but two of them were low and one was high. So it's like at this point, stop everything, go back to the data owner and figure out what's going on, right? 
So this is <laughs> the analysis that I did last week for data. And the whole point is, don't trust your data. Questions on that? Sorry? Uh, that's a good question. So I think the answer was sort of. Like, they're, they're sort of in the middle. So this is like right in the middle of the recording. This one's a little bit towards the front. And then this one was roughly, I think, about the same. So whether there's a pattern there, I don't think three CSVs was enough to establish that. But it's a reasonable question. All right. So now we'll dive into, we should take a break. So we'll take a break. And then we'll come back at 8.05. I highly recommend getting up and moving out of your chair. Question? Right down in my calendar, so I don't forget. What time are you in the evening? Maybe six o'clock. Like, I don't want to jack you up. At, like, no, as soon as we don't have to cover the break, I can meet you. Like on any phone post, like cafe or wherever. Okay. I'm just gonna leave this as a reminder. I don't okay. come back to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just, I guess at the end of class, just come back. Yep.
So we're still missing two students, but I think we'll resume. So time has elapsed. All right, so back on your piece of paper, we have another exercise. If you can do this pretty quickly, it shouldn't take too long. Just write down today's day, date, and time. And if you don't know what it is, you can make it up because it doesn't actually matter. Just write down today's date. Once I get half the heads looking back at the screen, I'll come back to the next slide. All right. So, what do we have? Sorry, I want to volunteer. Spelled out how? Monday, yeah. Okay. Good. All right. I don't have anything different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. I'm going to get one more game. And what was the last part? Mm -hmm. So can someone who did not volunteer explain why we're seeing these differences? Point. 
Yeah, and, and every person thinks that their way is the natural, obvious, intuitive, correct way, right? I can't disagree with you on what the right, you know, thing is, but we can definitely recognize that if someone's passing this in their program to a data set, we're going to have to write different programs to parse all that. So that's going to be painful. There's a list of reasons that I came up with, right? It's like everybody can choose their own default. And then, like, it's all subjective choice. And so there's a bunch of different reasons, like space efficiency might be another thing, or like being very verbose and clear and explicit. That's another motive, right? And so as we said before, there's like what's considered local versus we can use uh, universal coordinated time. They're all choices, right? So luckily, we are not the first person to encounter this problem, right? Like every person who has ever first time series have had to deal with this problem. So you've probably already used the date time library, even if you weren't sort of aware of it. There's another reference I'm going to point you to. Um, this website, STRF, so script time, um, is a website purely dedicated to providing one web page, right? It's literally just one web page. And it's just all the things that people use in their timestamps. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, tell you what I mean. So let's pick out, uh, let's see. So Hector here had 27 March 2019 to 0. Uh, colon zero eight, right? And so we can symbolically represent that date string in Python using this lookup table. Right? So the easy one that I pick out immediately is like the month spelled out. That's going to be a percent D. Right? And then like the other one here, we've had sorry. Uh, well, this is uppercase. So, so but yeah, so this is September. Um, and then like the other ones had 0, 3, so this is 0 padded decimal, so that's a 4 case M. So basically there's a symbolic representation of all these different date strings, and then you can just sort of like combine the symbolic representation for 0, 3, slash, and then like the two digit date. Uh, let me give a scroll up here. Yeah, so that's like capital or percent D. So then the question is, like, once we understand that there's a symbolic representation of all these different timestamps, how do we use them? All right. Oh, oh. <laughs> link to the wrong thing. All right. Let's see if we can pull it up. Uh, time zones? Sorry. I have to figure out which. I did not link to the right thing. No. no. If I can't find this quickly, I'm going to skip over it. But... Mm. Oh, yeah. So that, I think this is the one that I want to do. So, mm. Is it... mm. I'm going to probably have to come back to this in case I can't find it quickly. So, unfortunately, I linked to the wrong thing in my slides, so I can't figure it out. All right. So, the next topic. I'll jump to from that is the thing that I've been harping on repeatedly is time zones. I do have a demo of that, so I'm going to pull that up. But basically, the, the naive assumption is that we can say there's 24 hours in the world, uh, 24 hours in the clock, so the Earth will divide that up into 24 regions or 24 time zones. That's wrong. So, how many people knew that? That we have more than 24 time zones? All right, it was a shock to me, so I'm not going to lie. But, so, this is the sort of like explanation of why that happens. So different companies, different countries make decisions about how they're going to run their distinct time uh, management. So they could be offset by a half an hour or an hour, whatever they choose, right? It's like a country-wide decision. And then, um, yeah, so there's 30 different time zones, 37 different time zones. And you can see here, like, the offset for New Zealand is 13 hours and 45 minutes. What a weird choice for the Kiwis. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so I'll get to an example of that. <laughs> right? Why wasn't the world designed by a data scientist? That's what I ask myself all the time. All right. so. <laughs> So I'm going to use a couple of different libraries here. Date time is one that I previously mentioned. Uh, I time zones, PYTZ, that's the library for time zones. So the, the default 
Um, when I get date time now, it's like a measurement of what time is it now. Right? And that returns this sort of like tuple of values, right? And you can see that's, let's, see, let's actually run it now just to, to get the correct time. I'm going to rerun that. For a moment. Yeah. Okay. So it is reporting the current time is the 28th of March at 57. That's not right. <laughs> right. So what's going on here? The, the, the time, as reported by Python, appears to be incorrect. Damn it. So the reason is because it is using uh, universal coordinated time. And during the summer, which is now, that's our current time. Uh, it can be minus four hours. Or no, no, sorry. It's the 27th of the right? So it is plus four hours. So this is not the actual time now here. It's the universal coordinate time. So, and then if you really want to call out, like, what is the time zone that this is using, then uh, say add a time zone, and then it tells you, oh, yeah, you're in UTC time right now, right? So then we can convert that to say, rather than use the full time zone, let's force it into using Eastern. And then we can say, oh, that is actually the correct time. So let's see. It's, uh, so I have to rerun that itself. That's why I was confused. All right, so the current time. Pull over. Yeah, there we go. Is that correct? We we'll get back. Yeah, we got back uh, 2016, which is basically 8:15 p.m., 8:16 p.m. in Eastern. So this is the amount of work that we had to figure out the actual current local time in our time zone. Right. So then you can sort of understand why do people not time uh, include the time zone in their timestamp data? Like it takes up a bunch of extra space, right? Like no one wants to carry that around because they're all working on local data. Uh, the, it is so three twenty-seven and ten changes that we're looking at. Yeah. I think it's twenty seven. It is. Yes, yes. So that's where I was getting thrown off also. So the it's thinking let's see, did I I'm not sure if I get that right. So it's the 28th, that's tomorrow at 4 p.m. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Eight plus four hours is midnight. So it's midnight and 16 hours. Sorry, thank you. 16 minutes. All right. <laughs> Math, how does it work? All right. Sorry, that was a bunch of work to show you that the time zones are annoying. So thank you for sitting through that with me. And then it gets worse, right? So like, <laughs> we talk about universal coordinated time, which doesn't have daylight savings. Right? If you're familiar with the fact that we lose an hour in the, let's see, we spring ahead in the spring and we fall back in the fall. right? So that's yet another annoying thing you need to count for. And then it gets worse, right? So like, you'd think you could say like, this state in is, is in a specific time zone. That's also wrong. So let's look at the exceptions for that. So these are the sort of natural assumption that if you're going to state all these states is in one time zone. But if we look through this at the very bottom of this list, so 14 states have multiple time zones. For Alaska, that's because it's a really big sprint. So it makes sense. But the other ones are like Michigan and Kentucky, Kansas. Like they just want to be weird. I guess I don't know. The state legislature probably made some like pronouncement. You know, for their constituents, and I don't know why they did that. So, All right. so <laughs> questions on that? Like, that's just another sort of gotcha when you're working with time zones. Not everyone is following the same clock. Okay. Oh yeah. So that, that's basically the point that time zones are annoying, and they're even worse because they're not fixed. Right? They depend on where you are and what time of year it is. Crazy. All right. Which is why that's why we're using. Back to that universal coordinate time, if everyone set their clocks to universal coordinate time, we wouldn't have this problem. And so that's why programmers are lazy and they don't have to use what's called epoch time. So epoch time plus the fact that you're going off UTC makes everything way easier. Great. So I think I've, I've seen a few people use this. I've used it in my notes. Basically, there's the date time, which is what you use to translate date, but then time is what I use to like. Uh, it's the current timestamp in Lexington, 1970. 
So that's, if everyone agrees to a convention, it's super handy. But not everyone does. And so this is why, like, typically you'd have to take the timestamp and then convert it into a thing that we're more familiar with working with, right? Like, no one has a wristwatch that reports times in 1970. So even though this is a, a like, common consensus we can all agree upon using, in practice, we don't actually use that. We use something that looks like this. Like, there's some gymnastics of switching between the different formats that are natural for your environment. Questions on that? Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground very quickly, so a lot of confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you just, uh, I think, I haven't seen that, but I think either you just divide by number of seconds in a day. I'd have to imagine that someone has done the tricky math of like the 20 to leap seconds and like crazy stuff like that. So like the, you'll get kind of approximate if you just divide, you know, 360, assuming 365 days in a year. It would be slightly more accurate if you assume 365.25 days in a year. Right? So there's all the little gotchas associated with the calendar. But I'm, I'd be reasonably confident that somebody wrote that library to get the dates since 1970. Computers. In general, speaking, computers. Like anyone in any programming language can sort of use that as a reference. It's it's a consensus. We'll call it in the IT world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, the programming language I use is January 1st, 1960. Yeah. I think it's Stella. Which language is that? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so it's not that there's one. So it's not that there's one standard, but this is one of the standards. So uh, Epic Time uh, is a general concept. Uh, is is a reference time, but yeah, different programs will still. They want to differentiate themselves, and so like they'll make it hard to switch from their program to something else. So, yeah. All right, and then this goes into the history of like why this was chosen. It's convenient, and there's some mathematical reasons. So, all right. <laughs> yes, but you make a good point. Other <laughs> programming languages intentionally break that convention by setting their own local one. You'll notice that was two proprietary programs that we suggested. <laughs> All right. We'll do a little bit of visualizing for time series. Uh, I'm going to go off of a data set that I made up. Uh, it's something that I think will be generally useful in your real life after you leave here. Not so much like immediately, but just something to keep in mind. So typically when you're writing, the reason I wrote this is because when I'm writing programs, sometimes they're not very fast. And so I like to figure out why are they not fast. Right, in order to figure out why they're not fast, I have to figure out what's causing this program to take longer than it should. Is it the memory? Is it the CPU? Is it the network? Is it the disk? Right? All of these different components on my computer can be not as responsive as I want them to be, which is my program to run slower. So what do we do? Right? We can ask the computer, how much memory is the program using right now? How much program, uh, how CPU is the program using now? How much disk is it using now? Right? Starting to hear that timestamp language of like what's going on now, right? And you can ask that frequently, right? Like let's say every second. So your computer happens to have a lot of sensors on it. And so all of these sensors are things that you can collect data from, and you have to have a timestamp with them. Right? So that's that's nice. Let's take a look at that. Not this one. So I'm going to do a quick little rundown of like where the data is coming from, and then we'll use that data set to do some visual analysis of the data. This is just a, a quick review of where the data is coming from. So basically, the, the root library that I'm using here to enable all this, PSUtil, so that's the, the library that allows me to access all these different measurements on my computer. And so I can get details from my computer. If you're not familiar with all this stuff, it's a little bit, um, it's a little out of scope for the class, but basically to give you some familiarity of what's going on behind the scenes, everything that you run on your computer is a process. And there's a unique process ID that goes with that program. And so 
I can ask what is the process of my what's the process ID of the current thing that I'm running. So for instance, in this case, the Jupyter notebook, I can get a unique identifier associated with that process. So when I ran this, this was process number 798. All right, and then I can get some details about the process by using this PS detail library. So I can get like what's the name of the program, when it started, and all this other good stuff. So then, like, what was the command line that launched the process that I'm currently observing, right? So then, now that you have some some context for, like, oh, we can learn things about what my computer is doing. So let's look at a bunch of different things, right? How much CPU? Uh, let's look at the amount of memory it's using. And then, like, I think, uh, yeah, disk I/O, right? So this basically, I'm telling you that there's a bunch of sensors that this library allows you to get data from. All right. So then we write a little function to gather all the data. And then to go a little bit crazy, you can ask, what are the other processes running on my computer? And so, yeah, so here we can see we've already gathered back um, for, a point, for a single point in time 328 different sensors. That's basically all the things that I was playing with there. And then you can uh, do this for every other process on your computer. Right, so you can gather what are the statistics associated with every single notebook that I'm running. And so you can use, this is the fun part right now. So we've got a notebook that can understand what a computer is doing for its own process. And we can change and point that to a different process, right? So I have a, a notebook that I have running. I want to, want to understand how is it performing. So I would tell this notebook, go we'll look at that process for the other notebook. Right? And then I'll be able to monitor how that notebook is performing. So that's, uh, it's a little bit uh, down in the weeds, but basically I'm going to point you back to, once we've collected all that, we can put it into a data frame, right? We've got hundreds of sensors over a lot of time, and so this is a giant pandas data frame with timestamp data. That's the whole point. All right, so now we're going to go through and analyze that data and see what it looks like. So, all right, I did this for 10 minutes, so I got, 1.3 seconds, so that's 600 measurements, right? not, a, not a crazy amount. And then, as, as I pointed out, there's 328 different sensors that I'm measuring data from. So why do I care? Right? It's because this data set is larger than I'd want to look at everything manually. So I'm going to have to apply some data to filter out the things that I don't care about, and then do time series analysis on the interesting stuff. All right, so I can plot random columns and just see you know, for the notebook that I was watching, I can say how much CPU time was it using. Right, okay, 100%. So this plot isn't very exciting because it just says this is the second index, right? So from 0 to 600 seconds. That may be sufficient, and we'll just walk away at this point. But because this is a class on time series, I'm going to make the plot a little bit more instructive. All right, so those are the values. It's just a, a series of data. Right. You can change it into a scatter plot. Nothing exciting there. And then I happened in my data set to record the timestamps. And I was using that time.time .time command to record the time in unit second. So that's like that big number there, right? So if we want to go plot that, it's not gonna actually look that it's gonna look actually worse, right? Because like now we're confused. This is the second since 1970, that's almost unusable. Right? We've tried to add more information about when this measurement actually occurred, but we've actually made it more easy for the user. So the next trick is then to convert that column of data into a timestamp. We can do that on the entire column. We get back a bunch of timestamps. And then we can use those to label the axis uh, so it's March 24th at 1245, March 24th at 1250. And so matplotlib here is basically uh, showing you the data that it is relevant rather than the entire timestamp. So this is a little bit easier to read. Um, and if we really want to get fancy, we can rotate those labels so that they look even better. But in this case, it wasn't super neat necessary. So. Uh, this, what, what, do you, what about that CD user or whatever process? Like what process are you? 
So this was a recording of another notebook that I was running. But this this uh, sorry. This notebook that I initially showed you, this is the one that records and creates the data frame while looking at other notebook processes. And then this the second notebook that I was showing you now, that's the analysis of the data that was captured about those other notebooks. You know what I'm saying? What is that? <laughs> yeah, I don't. So I don't. So we could get the information about what that notebook was running at that time, but I don't have that uh, in this analysis. It is recorded, so I recorded the commands, but that's not there. Yeah. So the event. So where John is going is like there's a story here, right? It wasn't using a bunch of CPU, and it was. And so the question is, what was the command that caused this spike in usage? Right? Fully reasonable. You need to combine. A time series of the CPU usage with the time series of the commands that were run. So you can sort of label this event as when I ran this command, this thing happened. Yes. I think. Oh, yeah. And then the last sort of like observation I'll make is that typically, so we've done this all a bunch of work for one column in our data frame. And so in order to avoid that work, being done over and over. Remember that a pandas data frame is an index, right? Integers, usually starting from zero through six hundred in the, or zero through five hundred ninety-nine in this case. So it'd be useful if we could do this timestamp and make that the index. So that we wouldn't have to do this work on a per column basis. All right. So you can get information about the index, say the index, and it will tell you from zero to six hundred. In step sizes of one. So that's our default data frame index. And what we really want to do is make our timestamps the index. And so we can set index to the column that we have there. And then when we look at our new data, our, our revised data frame, our index is the timestamp. So that makes our analysis a lot easier because we're going to be doing this for like 300 different. Columns, right? So we wouldn't have to do that every column. All right, connecting. That's good. So this is a suggestion that if you're going to be doing time series analysis, you'll have to take your data frame, make the index into a time series, and it'll make your analysis a bit easier. All right. All right. Now we get into the what I consider like the the, the magic part, right? So. Magic part. So now we've basically established a baseline of skills of like making our data act the way we think it should. What can we do with that cleaned up data set? That's the current question. All right. So we take some some data set that has some behavior in it that we're like, okay, that's interesting, right? So like this is the number of airline passengers from like 1949 to 1960. So you'll notice there's a couple things around there, right? There's a trend that goes up. Right, there's some seasonality where they get this competitive spike. I'm going to guess, straight up guess, right? But this is Christmas. It's the holiday season when people travel. So the number of passengers spike between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Right, but the, the thing that we want to do is figure out all these different things. We want to understand what is the trend, what is the seasonality. So how do we do that? Sorry, what was it? Uh, so if, if so, this is 1955, this is 1957, there's actually 1956. Mm -hmm. I think that's between like November and December. But whether that's legit or not, but that's like a speculative guess. Right. So there's a few things that we'd have to make sure before we do our analysis on the data, we have to figure out um, what patterns can we take out of there and which ones are going to mess up our analysis. The, the thing that we're aiming for when we do our analysis is to make sure that there are not trends in the data. We remove those. Um, and then there's variance and covariance. And so these are basically any analysis that we are going to do can be screwed up by these different sort of like behaviors in the time series data. So we have to figure out how to remove those and basically remove the trend and then like make the variance consistent so that our other analyses are going to be more useful. So the, the first action that we'll want to do is 
figure out what that trend is. And I'll show um, a couple different ways how to do that. Um, one of them is called a rolling mean, and the other is a linear regression. If you can just say like it's a straight line, we'll figure out what that straight line is. So we'll come back to that. And then the other thing that we're going to do in the rest of this class is look at the fact that you can pick out repetitive patterns in data. So once you've figured out that there's a trend in the seasonality, and you subtract both of those out of your data, what you're left with is the noise. And so you can model what the trend is, what the seasonality is, and then what the noise is. So there's some potential sort of like permanent patterns in here, but if you can say that this is just a random process, but that those three effects cumulatively describe your original data set. So this is where the power of predictivity, uh, the ability to predict things comes from, because you can say like, okay, I know that this pattern is likely to repeat next year, right? And I can sort of figure out where this trend is going to be, and then we can figure out what the pattern of this noise is. Right? It's like some uniform distribution or something, and you add those all up and you have a prediction for next year. That's the magic. <laughs> That's super powerful because it applies. Like this idea applies to all these things. That's where you make the money. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna walk through. So I just did like a really brief overview visually of what we're gonna be spending the rest of the class on. Now I'm gonna dive into a data set to actually show you how this applies. So first I'll show you where I got the data, and then we will do the analysis to it. All right. So this is what, how I spent my spring break, right? So I, I analyzed all the sensors on my computer, and I pulled back like decades worth of power data. So if you're wondering how I spent my spring vacation, that was it. No joke. And this data set's large, so it makes my computer slow. Uh, is this the one where I get the data? Okay. So there's this website. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> these, these websites, whenever I find them, I'm always like super shocked and super happy. So I'm going to show you what I mean. So, so there's this website I just totally stumbled upon, right? And it has air caught. I, don't even, I didn't even know what this was, right? But I can see you've got these times here, and it says hourly data for a bunch of years, right? So 2019, way on down to 20, 1995. So that's, that's like almost 25 years worth of data and an hourly scale. You'd be like, damn, got that. <laughs> right? That's like a lot of data, and it's like, okay, there's clearly some trends that we can pick out of there. So that's what gets me excited. All right. So and <laughs> being lazy, right? I don't know. This is like a questionable trade-off, right? There's roughly 25 links. You could just pick on all those links. Or you could use Python requests. Guess which one I did, right? All right. So I went through. I used Beautiful Soup. I got the website using request. All right. Then I parsed the HTML and found the links. I was like, these are not the links I was looking for. What is going on here? Right? The problem is that I was building the A href to be HTTP. Right? So the link should start with HTTP. And those links do start with HTTP. So I like, ah, I got it. We'll search for HTTPS. Because those links are HTTPS. Nope, wrong again. Right? These are the links also I don't care about. What's going on? Anybody have a suggestion for me? <laughs> yes, that is a good point. So you could view the source. And that would show you that um, these uh, links are actually relative. So what this is, rather than linking to the full URL of that um, file, they just say, Relative to where this web page is, it's over in this other directory. So relative links don't start with HTTPS or HTTP. So then I pulled back all the relative links, and then I found this long list. Huh, zips and XLS. Those look good. So then I had to filter out all the things that are either starting or ending, sorry, with XLS or zip. That is the list of the files. So then we can just grab those as a bunch of URLs and then get the files using requests. Questions on that? So that's basically how I got a bunch of files. It would totally have been easier in this case to just download 
25 links, right? So lesson learned, don't write code. I don't know. So Does that just like check like these files and Yes, they contain data, so that was the exciting part. All right. Questions on inappropriate uses of requests? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So the real reason I did this, right, was to show you yet another example of request and to give you sort of like some insight, right? So I think clicking on 25 links would have been easier in this case, but it's a little exercise. All right. So then the outcome, sorry, the outcome of all this good work was a uh, pickle file. Who here has used pickles before in Python? All right. Pickles are vegetables that you put in a salt brine. And, oh, wait. No, that's wrong. Pickles, sorry, are serialized data objects for Python that you store on file. So what that means is I have a variable in my Python memory stack, and I get that to disk in a compressed format that's very uh, small, right? And then I can use that same library to read it off of disk back in the memory. So this is to revisit a point that I think I've made earlier in the semester, which is the way I typically break my workflows into components is I'll have a notebook that does a thing, in this case, grab a bunch of files, and then the output of that file is a pickle, right? a, a file on disk. And what that allows me to do is the next step in my workflow, because I'll do like a couple work uh, steps in my workflow, it assumes that that pickle exists, and then it does some transformation to it. And when that step in the workflow is done, it does another pickle, right? And so the reason I do this is to make sure that if I want to rerun my analysis notebook, I don't want to have to rerun the part where I download all the code. So I'm basically chunking my workflow into steps, and I'm separating them with pickle files so I can just read and write individual steps without having to do all the steps. Does that make sense? For breaking the workflow, because it's complex and in multiple steps, we can do each one in only. I'm using pickles to facilitate that. All right. So I just at the end of this one, I just save the data frame to pickle. The next notebook here reads in that same pickle as a data frame. It takes uh, 0.42 seconds, and then it's got this huge data frame. All right. So super convenient. This data took practically no cleanup. That was pretty amazing. I don't know why. All right, and it has no null values. So <laughs> this is like a miracle in data science, right? No NANs, no cleanup, download the files at work. And it's hourly data for 25 years. Can you imagine the curation process, right? Someone was sitting at a desk for like 20 years making sure that this policy was consistent for us every year. That's amazing. <laughs> you will only find that amazing after you work in the real world, I guess. All right, so, sorry, I forgot to mention, in this data set, they've taken the state of Texas and they've broken it into the seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think seven regions, no, nine, sorry. Seven, uh, eight regions and then one overall one. So, um, if we look at this, this is the annual power load for a subset of Texas. Right? I think it's probably in like megawatt watts, I don't know, but basically you've got Representative pattern over the years from 2002 to 2014. I didn't do all the data for various reasons, but we'll get back to that. All right. So that's just like a quick overview. We've got a bunch of data, and I already did the uh, the timestamp cleanup, so that's already there. All right. So now the expectation is that we should see repeating patterns on a 24-hour basis, a weekly basis, an annual basis. All right. So the easiest way to check for this is just visually inspect a couple hours and see if you see the pattern, right? You guys have already done this in homework, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Scroll down a little bit. So there is sort of like a, a daily sort of fluctuation on a 24-hour time scale, right? That's totally what we expected, so we're super psyched. No problems. Then if you zoom out again and you say, we're only going to look at 30 days, right? so it's every measurement is once an hour. So that number of measurements is 30 days and 24 weeks a month. So that's what that max count is. And I'm looking over the span of 2006, I think, from January 1 through 30. There's some weekly trends there. So this is good. Why are we doing this? We're trying to figure out whether the data behaves as we expect. And we're going to look for patterns. We're going to make sure that those patterns actually exist in a small sample before looking at the entire data set. 
Okay, and then we can look at so 24 measurements times 365 days. That's a year's span. So there is some sort of spike, roughly in the months of the really, January, February, March, April, May, May through Octoberish, almost like summer, right? When people are running their air conditioning in Texas. So that makes sense. So we've done a bunch of storytelling on this data, a small subset of it, and so far it's making sense. So we've done no up, there are no NANs, and the data all makes sense. Like, can you imagine my disbelief? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I pulled back this picture from the ERCOT website just to make a little bit more sense. There's, I think, eight regions, and then, like, ERCOT is, like, an overall one. But these are the different sort of sections of Texas just for context of where we're looking at this data. Okay. So I'm going to skip over the fact that you can plot every column independently, but let's go back to that lag plot. Is this actually time series data? The intuitive answer is it should be absolutely time series data, right? So if we plot a lag plot, you get that nice uh, linear line of data, right? And that's the difference between every measurement and the one after it, right? And so there's a relation there, so we call it a time series. No big shock. All right, so that was the difference between any one point and its one after that. There's another plot we can make called an autocorrelation plot. This is looking at the correlation between one point and the one after it, one point and the one two after it, right, one point and one three after it, and sort of see where this is going, right? There's a leg of one, leg of two, leg of three, right? and it sort of tells you um, where we're going to see patterns emerge. Um, and then so what we get is this nice pretty picture, but basically all that really tells you is that there's some seasonality effects. So what this is showing is that there's a correlation on the scale of a year. And you could have picked that out if you went back to the original plot. Right? All, all this data, the major spikes that we see are during the summer on a year scale. So that's all the autocorrelation is telling us is that there's a time scale similarity on the order of a year. And those, yeah. so the confusing thing is the lag. That's the count. Right? This is the point in itself, and then the one would be the point and the one after itself. So that around like, I think it's 8,000. That's the number of points in a year. That's where we're getting that lag count. All right. And then you can even get this fantasy statistic picture of what the confidence level is for this. So. Not that I'm not going to use that too much, but yeah. All right. Now, the other thing that I mentioned, not only can you pick up sort of the repetition, but you can also pick out what the trend is. So one method for doing that that we'll talk about quickly and then take a break is rolling average. OK. So a rolling average is the name describes what it does. Right? So if I've got a time series. The points here. And I say, what is the average of things in this window? So the average in this window will say is about here. And then what's the average in this window? And we'll say it's here. And so you can see that. For a given window size, you're going to get a dip average in that window. So if you change the size of your window to be larger, you're going to capture less of that change. So this is a, getting back to the art of data science. Knowing that the size of your rolling window will affect what average you see is a skill that you can have. So what is a good rolling window size? Well, it depends on your data set. The other thing to observe is that because your window Starts with the initial data point to some other data point after that, you're going to lop off the initial set of points. Right? So you won't get a rolling average value at point zero or one or two, right? It'll be in the middle of that window, which is why if we run a, the rolling command in pandas against a series of data, like the east column, that's why we're going to get back um, a bunch of NANDs. Right? So the first few data points for that rolling window. Uh, we're going to get NANDs. So the, the rolling average is not going to cover the entire data set. Mm. 
yeah, so here I, I chose window size five. So the first four data points are NANDs. Okay, so what does that get us? Well, let's take our full few decades worth of data, power data at the hour resolution. Remember that was super noisy up here. Let's go back to our initial plot. So that, that's really noisy data. There's a bunch of data points. It sort of obscures the fact that there are ends in there. And so the, the rolling average is a way of smoothing out all of that and picking out the pattern. So here, let's see, what was the rolling window size? Um, so 7 times 24, that's the number of data points in a week. So my rolling window size over the span of these many years is a week. All right, we're all good on that. So let's say let's let's it's a little bit noisy. So let's make our window bigger. All right. So here we've made our window size to be a month. That cleans up that noise that we're in the week scale windows. All right. So this is looking better. We can clearly see the the pattern of a year. Right. What happens if we make our window really big? All right. So this one is now two months. It's you know we're starting to see these little gaps down here. So if we make our window too big, what it's doing is it's smoothing out the signal. So that's a bit of a problem. We have two components you can think of in the data, right? Some signal and some noise. And what your rolling window is doing is called a low-pass filter. So it's smoothing out all the noise in your data to remove the things you don't care about, leaving you the trend. But if you make your window too big, you remove even the trend. Then you get these discontinuities where, like, the data just starts to, like smooth out to nothingness. So that's why these, these discontinuities doesn't mean there's no data. It just means that there's no more signal in that range, and so you have to realize that <laughs> it gets worse. And then, then you're clearly too far, right? And you've lost all the signal, and now you're just like, this doesn't make any sense in this. So it's a subjective sort of decision to how much smoothing gets you the trend and how much gets you the noise and all right, questions on rolling windows. They get you the sort of signal obscured by the noise. And then the last little uh, tidbit, oh, I said we're going to take a break. We should take a break. Okay. We'll come back at 8, would that be 56? I don't know if it's a long one, so we'll do 57. <laughs> Yeah, 
I have not yet found uh, an answer to one of the questions that they have, like, if I can decompose the seasonality issue, like, for one season, basically, so, like, if I can do it per week or per hour per year, like, you can do one seasonality decomposition, but I have not figured out how to enable multiple seasonality. Like, I know there's a weekly trend and I know there's a yearly trend. Both of those separately decomposed. I haven't figured out this library well enough to, to do that automatically. So like basically what I'm going to show is I have, I can scan for different windows of size. So this rolling window is sort of like an introduction. This idea, but I haven't figured out how to get multiple seasonalities decomposed. We're waiting for a few more people to we'll wait for like one more and then we'll take it forward. But yeah, a lot of the so a lot of the stats packages are in PR. And like I think they get 
probably migrated over from R because like Python wants to be competitive with R. So, but the statisticians work in R, so that's where a lot of the packages are originating. Okay. Mm. All right. So we'll resume. All right. So what we were talking about was the rolling windows, rolling windows to figure out um, for a given size of the rolling window, what is the average behavior in that rolling window. And by that, we can pick out different patterns in our data. So all of this has been sort of like, as I was talking about uh, during the break, sort of bundled up in these packages. And so they're pretty handy because we can run that decomposition that I was showing in the slides in Python against our data. So you just pass it in the data frame, and it passes back this to the decomposition. So it's super push button. So a reminder of what the data looks like. So we have a couple columns. One column is called our n. That's like the bin of our measurement, right? You go back to the one that I was saying about bins versus instantaneous. This that um, I think it's the end of the bin is marked. And so it's every hour. And so what we want to do with that is we want to plot the the series where the index is the timestamp. So I talked about that in a previous notebook where we typically want to make the index a timestamp. And this, the function that I'm going to show you, is looking for a series. So if you've got the index as a timestamp, then what you'll get as a plot is the x-axis with a timestamp. So that's pretty handy. All right. So again, our data is uh, taken every hour. So then take it 10 days, I'm going to pass um, the first 240 measurements as my data series. And then I'm going to say uh, the window size basically is 24 measurements. And so what we get back from that is here's what the 240 measurements look like. And then it takes out of that automatically for us the trend and the seasonality. And so in this case, it's a little confusing. The word seasonality mainly just refers to the fact that there's a repetitive pattern in the data. Because we're looking at a window size of 24 hours for our seasonality, the seasonality here is actually referring to a day. Right? So every one of these is the day. So that's just to deconfuse the issue a little bit on the seasonality. It's just the thing that repeats. Okay, so that's kind of handy to pick out what the trend in seasonality is, and then yes. Yes, good question. That's in our top of our notebook. There's a stat model. So this is what I was talking about with John during the break, is that people have done the hard work of taking all this analysis and packaging up in these nice functions that we call. So the stats model package, written by statisticians. And so we just import the one function from that package. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if you know you're, if, so like, if you know you're not going to use anything else from that package, it just makes your life a little easier because you don't have to clutter yourself up by calling the package name and the function. So, like, if you're going to use the one function on your library, you can just import that function and then I have to call rand dot. Or any other function name. Okay, and then we can do this, the same thing for a month scale. So if we do the seasonal decomposition for a month, this is what the original data looks like. There's some trend, and then we start to see like because we're doing it on a 24-hour period, there's 30 days here, and so so it's kind of like a repetitive thing that you can pick out, and you can tell it's doing a really good job of decomposing that seasonality because. It's the same every day, right? That's fully what we would expect. So it's separating those out. And then there's some noise. Okay. Things get a little bit wacky, right? If you uh, make your frequency at the scale of a uh, week, right? so this is, now we've changed our window size. So we've, we've I'm sorry, the, the, the rolling window is now a week. And so even though this is the same data, right? This is the same. Uh, the, the, the range of the data we're looking at is 24 times 30, so that's 30 days. But we've changed the rolling window size, basically. And so now what we see is there is a weekly seasonality. Right? That's the, the 
days varying basically from the, the weekends and the middle of the week probably. We make this. So it's the same data set looks different because we've told the rolling window size to be different. So it's highly likely that this this trend is more relevant to us because we don't care about the daily and weekly trends. And so figuring out what the actual trend you care about is, that's the, the fun part. And then you can, I don't think these stories are exciting, but you can do like the full year, right? So this is the year 2006. And then we can set our frequency window. And so there's like where you want to go with this. I'm not sure what the story is that you want to tell, but you can pick out the, the trends for larger and larger data sets. So then you can, this is the, the full, yeah. So this is the full set of uh, data that I have for the more than a decade. So the seasonality, like now it's just, like repetitive on a really small scale. And you can pick out the, the annual the, like variation in the, in the data. Okay. So that's, just showing off a package that exists to do all this magic for you, but where it's coming from is basically doing that rolling. Uh, so we're showing up here, and then I'm going to talk about seasonality if we have time. It looks like we're going to probably run a little short. Questions on that? Not not all timestamp data is seasonal. So, um, like the. The, the medical data that I'm showing you where you yeah, have five minute time slices, that's on a 24 hour window, and so there's no seasonality there. It's just someone's heartbeat. Right? You don't have seasonality there. Okay, so we talked about rolling average to get the sort of the, the, the trend data. Another way to do that is linear regression. So I think next up, we'll talk about linear regression. This shows up in a couple different places. We're going to be talking about it in the context of trend analysis. But it shows up also for correlation analysis and for machine learning. So it's it's widely used, and I'm just going to talk about it in one context. I don't think we'll get to Fourier transforms. I might slide that in the next week. This is a to, to make sure we get some coverage on that. As I mentioned, uh, linear regression shows up in a couple different places, and if you've seen it in 602, it's in the context of supervised learning. So basically, you feed um, the algorithm a set of data, then train the model based on that, and then like you can uh, make predictions based on the training you've done of the model. If you're not in 602, don't feel bad. All right, so now we need a, a volunteer who is not in 602. Anyone here not in 602? Anyone else? Who else? Jack, we're going to pick on you tonight. What are your skills as a data scientist? You can come up and help me out. This is totally awesome. You can always opt out of volunteer. All right, so what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to give you this set of data on this plot, and I want you to draw a straight line. I have faith in you. Can you draw that straight line to marker? Yes, it is the best fit for that set of data. And I'm going to ask you, so he's not in 601, I pulled his primer. How did you do that? You know a little bit about the <laughs> 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 that, that wasn't the correct word. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> With your not, with your regression hat on, how did you do that? Uh, it's the line that is supposed to capture Okay. More details about that. How did you know where the line should be placed? Well, I just kind of looked at the general direction. Those data points are filling, and the roll line that seems to be the best fit. What best fits? I'm going to argue that your your measurement of best fit was minimizing the distance between this point and the line for all the points. Yeah. All right. Well. If he hadn't known any regression, which I failed to filter for, um, my prediction was that he would use the idea of trying to minimize the distance between the, the line he was making and the points that he was trying to fit his data to. But that, it, it's fun to have this done when someone has no idea about linear regression and they already know the algorithm. So it just tells you how simple that algorithm is, right? That people know it. Um, it's a form of regression called Deming regression. But okay, so that. 
uh, linear regression different like what is it that you're trying to minimize so typically um, we're trying to minimize the the, course, the vertical distance between the points because the uncertainty is in your outcome variable that's a minor point so basically you're trying to minimize that distance okay so for normal data like things that behave well that ordinary least squares approach uh, is is pretty straightforward to understand. The complex, the you need some alternative techniques when the amount of variance in your data changes as a function of this parameter. So we can basically see that this is getting wider as we go out. So the idea of minimizing the error along all these data points equally to fail. The amount of error here is to be more sensitive. The error up here, there's a bunch of errors, so it's gonna have a different weight on the on the how well that line fits. So, and then there's a bunch of other tests that, like, if your data isn't well behaved, you have to apply special techniques to get the linear regression. But it, there's typically a test for your data if you don't understand what the, the problems with it are. So if you don't believe all of that, there's this XKCD comic I'll refer you back to. There's basically a bunch of different fitting methods. Um, <laughs> and so the joke is, like, you can fit a line to any data. That not, might not be correct, but you can always do that. All right, so as I said, linear regression gets you all over the place. So a couple different places, prediction, fitting trends, that's the one I care about, and measuring correlation. Those are standard use cases. And then part that I find sort of interesting is that there's both prediction within a bounded range, and then there's sort of like taking that prediction and extrapolating it out to a range you haven't seen before. Those are two separate categories of prediction. So like the, to draw this back, if you're sort of curious, like why do I care so much about this? Right? An example of fitting your data and the dangers associated with that, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. So I used to teach physics on a fun job, right, working in the lab, teaching people how to um, roll balls down ramps. And so the experiment in which this was being applied was uh, they they weren't the little kids in couches, but it was basically the same thing in a physics lab, right? So they had this ramp and it had little lift on the end of it. And so the ball would roll down, and then it would hop off that lift and into you know place to catch it. So if that's physically sufficient for you to visualize what's going on, that's the lab. And the and the goal was to reinforce the fact that this ball came down some noble mathematical pattern called a parabola, right? second order polynomial, pretty straightforward stuff. And so they had to capture um, the points um, as the the ball was traveling through the air. All right, so this is the sort of analysis I would get. So we, we saw the ball at this distance away from the ramp at this height. Right? So that's a point that we'll record. And then another uh, ball rolled down the same ramp at this distance away from the ramp at this height. Therefore, that's another data point. Right? So we can mark down where the ball was observed at all these different places. It's this uh, straight line. We're good to go. Turn in the lab homework. Done. Boom. Does anybody have a problem with that? Actually, we got a head nod. Anyone else got a head nod from that? So, so <laughs> imagine this ball rolling down the ramp and just going off straight into space. Does anyone have a problem with that? You absolutely should have a problem with that, right? So what the problem was, they were using Excel to fit the ball rolling down the ramp, jumping off. And it fit the data points that they had collected, so they were done. And the problem with this is, yes, that analysis is correct, but it makes us, misses the big picture. So the big picture here is that, uh, so they're measuring a subset of their data that does appear to be linear, but it totally misses the point that the ball does not go off into space, right? That'd be an incorrect extrapolation. You have to collect sufficient amount of data points. So that was the problem. So. The danger here is like if you think your data is linear, you should have an understanding of the story about how the data was generated to figure out whether that's in a valid approximation. All right, so don't trust your data just because you can fit a line to it. It's the takeaway. All right. And then so the the thing that I always sort of poke people is like if you collect more data that's available, you'll have a more complete story. That usually incurs more work, so they're less willing to do it, and no one wants to go back to more data. But if you know that there's more data to be collected in a range you haven't seen before, it will test the hypothesis that you have. 
So back to the data science part, like you have a hypothesis, it's the straight line, you collect more data, it's not, we have to revise our hypothesis. That's the process. Okay, cool. we're gonna have time to get the factor transform. <laughs> and I don't have any questions on linear regression. I'm not gonna force you to do linear regression in the homework, but uh, it's something that I'll probably inflict upon you later. All right. So the Fourier transform is, I'm not going to dive into the deep math of it, but basically it's a way of taking a set of data and figuring out what the recurring patterns in it. So if you remember, we took some data that was a time series, and we decomposed that into a trend and uh, a seasonality. So the trend part is uh, either you can use a rolling window or linear regression, some other way to figure out what the average values are, and the other part is to figure out what the seasonality is. All right, so let's switch over to a Fourier transform. The goal of these little demos here for the Fourier transform is merely to provide some intuition of what's happening. So the, the first little picture that I have up here is the idea of decomposing a signal into multiple um, other sets of data. So the starting point for this little animation is the fact that you have some like weirdly shaped sort of step function. That's your initial input. And basically, the, the point of a Fourier transform is that you can decompose any signal into a sum of a bunch of other signals. If you haven't thought about that before, I'm going to walk through that a little bit. But the idea is that once you've summed up all these other signals, you get back your original one. And so that one way of describing that signal is by telling what it decomposes into. So that's the idea of taking your time series data, figuring out what the rec recurring, recurring patterns are using a Fourier transform, and then that describes the seasonality of your data. That's a conceptual quick overview. Okay, so to see that in a little bit more practice, here's a bunch of code, and basically all that does is generates this sine curve, right, that wavy pattern again. And so there's a package called FFT, or is it in here? Yeah, so basically in NumPy, there's a fast Fourier transform, it's the FFT library. And then you can see that so this, let's go back and look at that in a little bit. Can't quite get the whole thing. All right, okay. So we have, this is going somewhere, so hold on with me for a moment, right? So we've got this sine wave is oscillating. What's the frequency of its oscillation? Anybody have a guess or an answer? Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, so that's the amplitude of the wave. Yeah, so the frequency, the way that we get that is, this is our, our time marker, so if you just look up here, this is one second, and then two seconds, or however many seconds you want to account for. Yeah, so it's five, right? So there's, there's one, so one wave of the sine curve is here, and then there's another one here, and so if you count how many waves are there in one second, that's the number of waves per second, which has the units hertz, H E R T Z one, right? H E R T Z. So that waves per second is the frequency. So this has a frequency of five waves occurring here, another five waves occurring there, right? And we can see that from the equation that I hid from you, right? So the frequency of the signal in hertz, that's five hertz, and then we pump that into the sine equation, the sine function. That's just our math convenience function. And we're applying a, a, the signal frequency hertz over the time domain. We go back to this picture. So that's the, the initial setup there. And when we take the Fourier transform, what it does is it decomposes our signal into how many sine waves does it need to account for that input signal. So the answer in our case is there's no waves with frequency zero no waves with frequency one, no waves with frequency two, and then go all the way up to, there is a single frequency at, um, at the five hertz that would describe our input signal. So this would be totally obvious, right? We had an input signal operating <coughs> five waves per second, and what the Fourier transform tells us is there is one signal that could account for that input and happens to occur at five hertz. Again, yeah, go ahead, John. So basically, the 
obviously what the second part is saying, but what if the frequency changed part way through? Would there also capture a button? And would it also be? It's a good leading question. We'll come to that in the next plot. Yes. So, so this was basically to set a baseline. That there's no magic here. It's just telling you what the frequency of the input signal is. So what if we had two waves? I think that's sort of your question. All right. So basically, I'm going to set up uh, my 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 equation here is that I have my original sine function with the same five hertz. I'm going to have a different sine wave of twice the frequency, so it's two times the frequency, and a different amplitude three. I'm going to add those two waves together. So you want this is if you can sort of pick out that. Um, that sine curve, there's now two sine curves of different frequencies. One is half the other. All right, so when we look at the Fourier transform of that, there's two points. And this is very, very uh, clean, right? So there's like no other signals going on for all different frequencies except for at 5 and twice 5, which is 10. And, and we can actually see this is the scale is off quite a bit. Uh, so it's off because the Fourier transform has complex numbers, and this is returning just the real part of it. So that's a little bit deeper than I wanted to go, but um, this amplitude is higher than that one because we have a larger wave. If that was me setting the amplitude up here to be 3. The other amplitude is 1. So the amplitude in return by the Fourier transform not only tells you frequencies are present, but the size of those waves and their amplitude. Relatively speaking, this is one to three ratio. Okay, so you're like boring, right? We've got two sine waves. Fourier transform tells us two bits of information we practically already knew because they're just sine waves, right? Who cares? All right, so this is where it comes now a little bit more exciting to me, at least. See if you agree. I'm going to take those sine waves. I'm going to throw in some noise. All right, so I'm going to make our, our sine waves look a little bit more sketchy, right? Like you guys wouldn't want to run into this sine wave on the street. It's a little noisy, right? All right, so you can see I've, I've basically just thrown off things by a little bit. It's still visually obvious that there's two sine waves here. All right, so now what's going on? So now our Fourier transform is reporting that, yes, there's still two waves, and now there's something going on at zero. There's not actually anything going on at zero. That's the noise coming in and disrupting things. So there's some. Fourier transform is getting confused by the noise a little bit, but you can still pick up pretty cleanly that there's two sine, func sine functions present. Right. And so here, again, you shouldn't be that amazed. This still looks like a recognizable set of curves. The real part is when we get super noisy, right? Like, it's not visually obvious what's going on here, but it's those same two sine functions with a lot of noise. And you can go back into these notebooks after and like see where the noise was added. But to me, it's very visually hard to pick out the fact that these are two sine waves, right? The fun part is we go back look at that uh, Fourier transform. The output shows that we're getting a lot of noise on all the frequencies. But it's still pretty straightforward to pick out the fact that there's two dominant um, frequencies in our data. So where does this tie back into the time series analysis? Remember, going back to, uh, I think this one, how is this uh, magical library picking out the fact that we have repetitive data? And it's trying to figure out where are the frequencies in the data that we're, that we're able to pick out and separate from the original signal. And so that's the, the magic behind the scenes for the okay, picking out repetitive patterns in data. Questions on that? Ooh, Fourier, like if you haven't seen Fourier transform before, before, like you'll probably see them if you're in engineering or math or in data science a little bit, right? So picking out repetitive patterns is a thing that it seems like magic if you've never heard of Fourier transforms. Either getting stunned silence or people falling asleep. Yes. In order to get wouldn't the last thing you did want to be a function in order to take away, take away the more dominant mm -hmm. I think something that could be eliminated? 
So what I think what you're saying is back like in our original, let's see, put it on here. Like this, yeah. What's the first thing you want to do, I think, is your question, right? Yeah, strip away the, the, the pad book pattern and the signal book. Yeah. Leaving you with a more restricted sense of view or a lot of your activities. Exactly. Yeah. So wouldn't that last, very last thing you did, very last exercise, be the first you book to strip away? Right, but the, the, the problem there is that you, for a single data point, you can't figure out where, how much of that data point, where is the value coming from as far as like how much of that is noise, yeah. how much of that is trend, and how much of that is seasonality. So the usual tactic, the order of the approach is to like what's called detrending. So like if you see your curve like you know going up, the first thing that you do is make it so that the the average is flat, so that the the mean is consistent. Exactly, and then. The next thing to do is take out the seasonality, and then you're left with the noise. Does that answer the question? So that's the usual order. But yeah, so that like whether you care about seasonality, maybe you don't expect any seasonality, and so you would just throw a rolling window at your data to figure out what the average is. Like it, it there is some dependence on like do we expect seasonality? If not, don't try and pull it out. Right. So you so if you want, the question was how do you when would you want to analyze the noise the, the effect of noise, right? And so the the reason that's relevant is because let's say that you had some financial data just to pick on your topic a little bit, um, and so if you had financial data, you want to know how much uh, variance there is caused by the noise, right? So you can pick out the trend and you can pick out the seasonality, but the variance on that prediction is going to come from your noise source. So, on that project, you could take a one-off event and measure whatever. Not quite sure. What was this? So, sorry. Just for like easy examples. Like, let's say, like something crazy happened on Monday. Yep. That fault says it's more like an outlier. Yeah. And that's like present in the voice data. Yeah. You could, there could be like. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so the, the effect of the rolling mean or the trending is going to separate out sort of like the signal that you usually care about from the noise. And so your outliers are going to be included in that separation process. Yeah. Okay, good question. So, right, I think we will um, do a little bit more exercise. So, the last exercise is to find someone you have not talked to recently and talk to them about what you learned in this class. And there's a piece of paper after you've talked about that, write down um, what you learned and what was not clear. So first do the exercise, so come back in like four minutes, and then fill this up. So talk with someone you have not recently talked with. If you know their name, find someone whose name you don't know. That's why we have name tags, by the way.
It'll take one more minute and then wrap up with your All right, we'll come back to our seats and do a, a few minutes of homework. So the homework here is described. Um, as usual, we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about it and then writing down your attack on this homework. And then uh, if you have questions while you're thinking about it here in class, you can ask those to me so that we can dispel any issues that might not be clear. So read the slide and then think about how you will do this. You, you don't have access to the data yet. That'll be posted on Blackboard. Then let me know what questions you have about this assignment. Give you about two minutes to think about what you'll be doing. And again, these are generic attacks against data you have not seen yet. So the whole point of this time here spent in class is for you to plan your attack against an unknown data set. I think I'm going to move forward. I think there's just a few more slides, and then we'll come back to this one if anyone has any questions. So the question, basically, I'm hoping that you're thinking about in your head or writing down is a plan, right, so that when you're confronted with the data, you'll actually know, oh, I want to do these things, right? Yep, I think that's it. So any other questions on the homework while we're all here together? Yes. Then we define the data. Do we want to have the combined? Uh, no. Each of the Excel files. That's right. So then I think there's three Excel files. Um, maybe like two of them are LS. So you have to do the independent analysis for each one of them. That's 
literally all I have for this class, so you're dismissed. Right? Unless you want to keep sitting in your chair reading that, that's cool too. Yeah, yeah, so there was one more slide which basically said plan your analysis. So, was it? Okay.